and also some part of the world. Good evening to other part of the world people. So I'm glad to be of help here today to talk about the breakthrough in dementia. I thank the organizing committee for inviting me to share something about breakthrough in dementia. This is a relevant topic for today's conference. Okay, I will, uh, my talk will include about the introduction, breakthrough in the etiology, in the diagnosis, in the treatment, and then I would like to conclude with whatever we have discussed here. Okay, so as an introduction, all of us, we know Alzheimer's disease is a very complicated disease. Many areas of unmet needs, needs a lot of exploration and uh, people are going into the micro, micro levels of finding the reason for the disease and finding a cure for the disease. After listening to Dr. Algeria, Algiro, uh, I have really fantastic work uh, very minute that we really cannot understand the biochemical aspects of different chemicals, but that people are working all around the world to find a cure for Alzheimer's disease. I hope things will turn out well in future years. Okay, so as we start, Alois Alzheimer, I think everyone knows, he described about Alzheimer's disease in 1906. Since then, many scientists took interest and there were most, uh, remarkable um, striders in the understanding of the Alzheimer's disease and its effect in the brain. All the researchers and findings contribute to the better quality of life of patients and for the caregivers. Okay, so this kick up started when Alzheimer's Association as a non-governmental organization as an NGO started in 1980. So when we see the progress of dementia over the years from the time uh, the German physician Alois Alzheimer's found out the micro, uh, microscopic changes in the brain of a patient at the team, uh, not much work went on in the first 70 years. And after in 1970s, then started some interest of the research with Alzheimer's disease started from the research started by the United UK National Institute on Aging. Yeah, then around in 80s, the momentum started in increasing the awareness of the disease, looking for the cure for the disease or management. So that is when, when Alzheimer's Association was formed in 1980 as an, as an NGO. From then, a lot of work has been done. And along the way in 80s, they have identified the chemical A beta protein, amyloid protein, as one of the um, uh, pathological um, problems that is with the with the origin of the disease. And later, tau protein were identified as the reason for the disease. And the first clinical trial on the treatment with tacrine came in, but it was it discontinued because liver toxicity. Then in nineties. Um, again, treatment were emerging and they identified the gene that is responsible or that is linked to the Alzheimer's disease. Then later when US President Ronald Reagan developed the disease, that's the time they formed the first Alzheimer's, World Alzheimer's Day, or it was designated 21st September of every year. So a lot of things were started to um, build up from what they started with nothing. And in 20s, um, they have identified the Pittsburgh compound and then the journals was started in 2005, the Journal of Alzheimer's Association. It is a quite a good international journal and went on and on in 2010s. Then Obama has um, took it as a personal interest to find a cure for the disease or help the people with uh, Alzheimer's disease to find some treatment for it. And again, not long um, ago, um, Bill Gates announced that he, give, he is interested in fighting against dementia in 2017. Then I went and looked through it. After that, I don't know what's the progress. That's about two, four years ago or even five years ago. Um, how much of progress done, I'm not really sure because I Googled, I couldn't get much about the progress of this. 
yeah, the statement of Bill Gates. Okay, so it has went on. So now we are looking into certain things that what we can do, what is the etiology? There are many, many etiologies, a lot more postulates were put in, but I think it, there's no time to cover the whole lot in the next 20 minutes of time. So I will be briefly going through the important ones. I think every one of us know about through main pathology, two main pathology about Alzheimer's, what is called outside the neuron is the A beta amyloid flux. That is a water, it's not insoluble amyloid flux and they get deposited outside the neuron and then it kills the neuron from outside. Whereas the tau protein pathology, the neurofibers, it affects the new neurons from within inside and the neurons get affected and then they become fibers. Yeah. So these are the two main pathologies that they have identified and people are working on these two pathologies, how to deal, how to stop the progression of this pathology. So until now, not, not any concrete finding to use at clinical practice until today. Hope things will come in soon. Okay, so the etiology, what they found um, that there is some chemicals that is related in the brain that can cause Alzheimer's disease. What is that? It's an iron. But also everyone knows iron is an essential element for the brain. It is in our blood and it is essential for brain. But the proliferation of magnetic iron, iron oxide called magnetide, that affects, that is found in affected brains of the affected people with dementia or Alzheimer's disease. So what is that happening? That magnetite is not commonly seen in normal people, normal uh, brains of the normal human being, uh, unaffected people, but those affected by Alzheimer's disease, this magnetite and the amyloid protein interacts with each other and they form the flux, which is not soluble by the, um, which is not soluble and it is cannot be removed from the brain, blood brain barriers. So they thought maybe iron modifying drugs could help in to reduce or to stop the progression of amyloid pathology. Okay. So there are some theories about herpes virus where they did a large scale brain bank from three different places and they found they did a microscopic analysis of the brains of Alzheimer's patients and they found there are increased amount of herpes virus in the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease compared to those people who don't have Alzheimer's. So they think that is a, a reason, maybe herpes virus is one of the reasons for the etiology of Alzheimer's, but it's still a controversial hypothesis. So if it is true, then maybe some antiviral would able to help to reduce the progression of the disease. Okay. What is latest? This is quite interesting. What it shows, seven hours of sleep is optimal in middle and old age people. What is that seven hours of sleep? Um, they have done studies um, that is recently published yeah, in 2022. Um, scientists from UK and China, they collected data from 500,000 adults. That's a very big data. And these participants were inquired about the sleep patterns, the mental health, um, their physical health, and they were asked to do a um, series of um, cognitive tests. And they uh, about 40,000 of them, they had brain imaging data and also genetic data. So what was the finding that about all this uh, analysis, they find those people who sleep around seven hours a time, a day, at night, not more or not less, they performed well on various cognitive um, performance, like uh, processing speed, attention, memory, and problem solving skills. So they recommend people to have optimum sleep pattern. And also, I think that is important, probably uh, we should advocate on that, uh, put good sleeping habits. The next is uh, brain 
volume can be protected by keeping insulin and BMI at a low level. Yeah, that is why our previous speaker, uh, Mario, was explaining about insulin resistance. So we do exercise, then the, it is better for the brain volume. So it is a study involved 134 people on an average of 69 years old. And then what they found, they were uh, supposed to fill up about their physical activities over the past one year. And they had brain scan, measured the volume of the brain and glucose metabolism, body mass index and insulin levels and cholesterol, blood pressure and so on, all the metabolic um, syndromes. And what they found, those people who were physically active had higher volume of brain matter in their brain and higher average rate of glucose metabolism by the brain. So this is good. I always used to tell whenever I go for any talks, what is good for the brain, heart is good for the brain. I think everyone knows hey, this is good for the heart. This we should do, this we should not do. That same thing goes for brain health also. Okay. This is very important, social isolation. Social isolation is directly associated with later dementia. So this is a large scale study used modeling techniques to investigate the association between social isolation, loneliness and the incident for dementia. And they have adjusted all the other risk factors, including social economic factors, chronic medical problem, lifestyle change, lifestyle, depression, APO genotyping, uh, and what has found social isolation have shown to about 26% increased likelihood of developing dementia. So what is that subjective feeling of loneliness? You feel lonely and also objective social isolation are independent risk factors for later dementias. That was the especially very much relevant for people over 60 years old. I think during this COVID uh, outbreak, many of our elderly are being socially isolated. They have, they lost their contact with their friends going out and this had a major impact on them. Yeah, so social isolation is something that we can prevent. We can do something about it so that we can reduce the risk of dementia in later life. Okay, so next we go to the diagnosis, breakthrough in the diagnosis. So early diagnosis is always important. So the goal is to determine if any neuroimaging or laboratory or psychological test would help us to make an early diagnosis. This is important so that we can track the progression of the disease, monitor the medication's effect, whether it is helpful or not, and also especially for clinical trials of disease-modifying agents. So how the diagnosis so far we have done, mostly, especially in developing countries, the diagnosis is basically made on the symptoms, affected person's symptoms. So uh, these symptoms appear later, whereas the neurons get affected much, many years earlier than the symptoms appears. So what we have, our role is we have to diagnose as early as possible so that we can minimize the impact of the disease. We can slow down the progression of the disease. So now is aiming to diagnose before onset of symptoms so that we can do something on the, to target the disease before irreversible damages happen to the brain. So to have an easy and accurate diagnosis, there is role of biomarkers. I think in European countries is quite common to have uh, biomarkers for the diagnosis, uh, just like for diabetics, fasting blood sugar or glucose tolerance test is the hallmark. Similarly, they have biomarkers, but in developing countries, we don't commonly use biomarkers. So the biomarkers like CSF, cerebrospinal fluid biomarkers of tau or beta amyloid concentration, this concentration changes at different stages of the disease. And if we have to do, we have to have a validated test, which is with the standardized procedure should be done. Yeah, so I think um, this is not commonly done in, uh, in other part of the world, 
that is the way to move forward. Okay, that is CSA, uh, cerebral spinal fluid is an invasive procedure where we need to uh, make a person to come into the hospital and to do the lumbar puncture. What about other things like testing the tau protein or A beta protein in the urine or blood also can be done. It is much feasible compared to lumbar puncture. Uh, the researchers are going on with that for pre-symptomatic A Alzheimer's diagnosis. And also there some scientists have found there is the position of beta amyloid proteins in the lens of the eyes. So whether that is also important in the diagnosis or to confirm the diagnosis. But from that structural imaging, the like more MRI scans or CT scans of the brain, it just reveals the size of the brain, especially shrinking of the hippocampus. It's an early sign of Alzheimer's. Yeah, may not be a specific test, but it can tell something about the brain. But much more specific is PET scan. So in 2012, 13, 14 and all, they started with different, different radioactive imaging techniques to find out how different part of the brain is functioning and how the amyloid plaques are deposited, which part of the brain. That is also done, but PET scan is not commonly available in every hospital in developing countries. Probably this is relevant for developed countries. And functional neuroimaging like MRI, functional MRI, where, to, uh, where the glucose metabolism or oxygen consumption or utilization by the brain, when they involve in some neurocognitive um, stimulation or activities. So this will monitor how certain part of the brain is functioning when they are challenged with neurocognitive testing. So this test also can be used to monitor the progression of the disease. And also uh, when we get another drug that can reduce the progression of the pathology like amyloid pathology or tau pathology, this can be used to monitor the effectiveness of the drug as what we used to do, mini mental state examination in our clinical practice to see how the person is progressing and how the medication is helping. Uh, similarly, we can use this technique. And something is called functional near, near infrared spectroscopy that we have done in our university, collaborating with University Petronas, um, where there is um, um, the probe will be attached to the brain, uh, to the scalp, and it will monitor the amount of oxygen utilization and oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin on the left side of the brain, on the right side of the brain, when the patient is uh, subjected to do some cognitively challenging task. So what we have found from that activation, um, we can clearly differentiate between healthy controls, mild cognitive impairment, and mild Alzheimer's disease, how the brain oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin saturation changes. From there, we, can, we were able to differentiate. Yeah? We published this article in Frontiers of Aging. Okay, so now we come to the uh, treatment. Uh, what is the treatment? What breakthrough do we have in treatment? I think this is the most exciting um, that we are looking for a uh, treatment because many years we are waiting until now we are still waiting. Okay, so Alzheimer's dementia, the definitive diagnosis of Alzheimer's, of course, it's a histopathological um, testing of the brain that is a genotyping, whereas clinically we diagnose based on the phenotype. That means we are treating the clinical features of a failing brain. Yeah, So we do not have any treatment to treat the pathology, underlying pathology of dementia, but we are treating only the symptomatically. That's what available for us for now. So if you see through the history of treatment until now, we can we have cholinesterase inhibitors, memantine, 
or combination of therapies. Yeah. So from 2000 until now, 2023 going to be, we do have only this for quite some time, nearly a quarter decade. We are having this, um, sorry, uh, uh, 20, uh, nearly about 20 over years that we are having the same old medication we are using. So, but there are many researchers are going on with other cognitive enhancers, and of course, we are, we are targeting on early diagnosis and also finding the genetic causes. And now we are looking towards disease modifying therapies and agents. Among all these things, and we need to do a community wide prevention initiative that is also important, that is also uh, part of treatment or management of dementia. Okay, so there are many studies that. Uh, um, the target on the pathology or disease modifying agents, dementia prevention studies that the IN study um, that works on the beta amyloid flux and A4 clinical trial and Alzheimer's prevention initiative trials. So quite a few number of trials have been done. These are uh, disease modifying agent trials and then uh, targeting on the beta amyloid that is recently a map is a monoclonal antibody targeting on the beta amyloids. And uh, this have found early studies shows decrease in the A beta amyloid proteins in the brain in healthy volunteers. And then they went on to do the phase three trials and it has shown to reduce the cognitive decline in people with dementia. So the study was completed somewhere in 19, 2019 and 2020. And lately in June 2021, last year, about a year ago, um, Biogen Aducanoma, uh, that's still difficult to pronounce, is approved by the FDA. But there was concerns. The group of advisory committee people voted overwhelmingly against the use of this drug, against the approval. Yeah, so even though FDA approved, there are the advisory committee did not really agree to the approval. So we are still controversy in controversy. Yeah? So one year ago, it has been approved. Uh, we, it is not in our hand to use for our patients yet. Uh, I hope something can come out of it. And then other, uh, Jensen also has done uh, some trials with the ability to inhibit the beta secretase enzymes. There are two phase three trials going on. It's expected to complete next year and the year after. Hopefully we'll get something uh, new for us to treat our patients. And what about the next pathology? Previously, we were talking about amyloid pathology. This is about the tau protein pathology. Tau protein is a chief component of the tangles and it is a hallmark of Alzheimer's disease. The tau protein helps to maintain the neuron and also it is important to supply nutrients to the microtubules of the neurons. Yeah? So the drugs, that the pathology is about abnormal tau protein. There are drugs that to reduce the formation of tau protein. Yeah? There are vaccines uh, to stop the abnormal tau protein from being produced or developed yeah, to de destabilize the tau protein. Um, so it has the one of the, stu the study has completed and uh, still pending FDA approval. And uh, we had the opportunity to uh, take part in the Taurex trial uh, that was done in 2016 and it was published in the Lancet. What we found it was not effective in patients who are on the treatment with the cholinesterase inhibitors, but it was helpful for patients who are treatment naive at the higher dose. So they progress further to do with lucidity trial. Um, this is the lucidity trial. I really wanted to have this picture here because Genting is one of the main sponsor of the drug trial and collaborated with Aberdeen in UK and in Singapore. So everyone Genting, when they think about Genting, it's all casino and gambling center, yes. They are main in, uh, the revenue is from the casino and, uh, and gambling, but part of their 
um, revenue also goes for pharmaceutical. Uh, they have collaborated and uh, funded quite a lot with the lucid with the tau protein or tau rex trials. And uh, this has uh, already uh, went through the phase three trial and they have shown the data is quite promising um, in reducing the symptoms and declining the rate of um, decline, the rate of deterioration. And the safety profile was quite favorable. So they have just um, released the press release last month, 31st of May, that they have submitted to FDA for approval. I hope uh, we, it will be available for us to use if FDA approves this drug. Okay, so I'm not going to go in much details. There are many phase one trials going on. That's quite a number. And there are many phase two trials are going on to find a cure for Alzheimer's. And also phase three trials are going on. And we took part in the exoven study. Until now, there's nothing coming out of that. And again, before I finish my talk, I really wanted to emphasize that it's not just the drug alone in the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. We need to work on healthy lifestyle that should not be ignored. What is that? We have to have a good exercise, good diet and cognitive training. We have to make ourselves alert. And if you have vascular risk factors like metabolic syndromes, we have to get the metabolic syndromes under good control. Okay, so this is an important and quite an interesting study. Lance, it was uh, published in Lancet. And this um, is about a finger study. This is called a finger study, where the it is a, a community study, two, two years prospective study where a group of people were just given regular health advice and another group of people were given very good nutritious advice about the nutrition. They had group session, individual session about the excess, about the nutrition and they followed up closely. They were encouraged to do exercise two times a week, then four times a week, five times a week, six times a week. So they slowly increased exercise and they went through cognitive training and also they monitored on the metabolic or vascular risk factors every visit. And then they followed up for two years and what they found, the, uh, those people who had intervention, active intervention had performed better in the executive functioning, processing speed and in memory. So what the study tells us to keep us actively engaged in cognitive activities and have a good healthy diet. If you have hypertension, diabetes, lipidemia, have to give a good, have to have a good control. All these things also can contribute to prevention or delay of Alzheimer's disease. Yeah. So in conclusion, The Alzheimer's disease, there are various breakthrough in dementia. The first thing started from Alzheimer's disease described in 1906 by Alois Alzheimer. Since then, remarkable researchers and have done through and they found the main pathology as amyloid block and neurofibrillary tangles as the pathology of Alzheimer's. The risk factors have been identified in the form, formation of uh, Alzheimer's disease. And we have to minimize the risk factors and we are looking for a cure also and also we need to diagnose as early as possible it's clinically but from the history apart from that we also need biological markers for the diagnosis of um, alzheimer's disease apart from neuroimaging and we have to we are uh, anxiously or really eagerly waiting for some disease modifying agent for use. Until now, it's not available yet. Hopefully in the near future, we look for one. But about among all, I mean, while we are waiting for things to happen or to get a good drug to stop the progression of the disease, it is vital that we stay healthy, embracing healthy lifestyle, which has shown very much positive outcome in cognitive function. So with that, I finish my talk. I would like to take up any questions.